Hey guys, welcome back. Okay, so last time we looked at the eight cognitive functions. So today we're going to start to look at the 16 types. Now starting now with this video, we're going to take a different approach to the class because as you know, in the last video, I mentioned how we've run at the limit of where we are as far as studies go. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we're at the limit of what there is to show. And so as you guys know, there are two ways in which something can be shown to be true for somebody. Either somebody can show you a study, a, a paper with an authority that you trust, or somebody can just show you something that you can observe and verify with your own eyes. And so because we've run to the limit of where we are as far as the studies go, the rest of this series will be focused on actually just demonstrating the phenomenon before us in a way that you as the viewer can uh, decide for yourself whether or not the arguments being made are sensible and whether or not they, they hold water. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to go through what amounts to hundreds of samples. And part of the reason for this is because this course is a training course for a voltologist. And so just as is true of any sort of expertise, for example, if you're a pharmacist, then you have to familiarize yourself with hundreds of different medications and their effects. If you are a doctor, you have to familiarize yourself with hundreds of different diagnoses and the symptoms that go along with that. That's a kind of expertise that is volumetric in information. Likewise, in order to become a competent voltologist, you actually have to amass a volume, an archive of information in the form of samples, each of which represent a kind of voltology that you might see in nature. And so we need to have a database of hundreds of samples and understand them and to memorize them in order to have a comprehensive view of human voltology. And so what I want to do in this series is to provide you with a complete enough picture of all the diverse voltologies you might encounter when viewing a person and describe to you what that might mean about their psychology. Now, the full breadth of human expression is, is pretty vast. It's not infinite, but it is pretty large. And so you have to understand the whole breadth of it in order to really wrap your mind around the entire phenomenon. And there's no shortcut around that other than just learning all the different kinds of ontologies that are out there. And as you encounter them more and more, you'll know what they mean. So for example, if you come across somebody who you've never seen anybody quite like that before, and you don't know what they are, that's a gap in your knowledge. But as you encounter more and more people, eventually you'll start to see repetitions you'll start to see another iteration of that person. And you'll say, hey, I've seen somebody just like that before. And this is what they were like. And you can connect the people together. So in these set of videos, I'm going to try to provide you with as complete of a database as I can using my own uh, personal database as a starting point from which you can then build on and add to it your own samples and grow your own knowledge base from that. So ideally, a complete database would be at least a thousand samples wide but we're only going to go through a few hundred of those, but that should be sufficient to give you a starting point for this. Now, now something that's very interesting about this is that what I'm going to be sharing with you are samples that are part of my own personal database, right? And so they're limited to examples that I've come across, individuals that I've seen. But here's the thing about Model 1. It aims to be predictive. The claim is that it's a universal expression of humanity, which means that this is going to allow you to test and make predictions of people that I haven't encountered. So for example, if there's somebody in your environment who I don't know who they are, maybe they're your aunt or your uncle or somebody from a different country who, who I could not have known their psychology beforehand. And yet using the principles that we're going to go through in these videos, there are predictions about their psychology that can be made and you knowing them personally can verify those, then that acts as a kind of evidence for a more universality to what I'm saying. Now, because this is going to be hundreds of videos, this is not going to be a sprint. This is going to be a marathon. So these, these videos are going to be long. Be prepared for that. Each video, we're going to look at around two minutes or so at most for each sample. But we're going to talk about the samples in some depth and try to understand their psychology as well. And as we're exploring these samples, I'm also going to have a spreadsheet open. And this is something that I call a motif matrix. And the reason for this spreadsheet will become clear at the end of the videos. But basically, I'm going to be noting within this spreadsheet the different themes, the different motifs that emerge from the samples as we go through them together as a form of documenting what I see. Why? Because we want to see at the end whether or not there's a root cognition that may be responsible for the diverse behaviors which we find within these samples. So you may have noticed that this model is called cognitive typology, right? 
And yet, up to now, we haven't really deeply delved into the cognition aspect of this. And there's a very important reason why we haven't gone there yet. And that's because cognition is one of the hardest things to get to in a deductive pathway. It's actually very hard to get to cognition empirically. And so the way we're approaching cognitive typology is first, we're starting with voltology, something evidenced in physicality. We're going outside in. So what we're doing is we're, we're measuring visual clusters and seeing how those relate to behavioral patterns, right? Such as what we saw with the career studies and so forth. But then we want to take a step beyond that. And after we see all these behavioral patterns, we analyze what may be similar within the behavioral patterns that have a shared psychology, which can be treated as the origin of these different behaviors as well. And can we isolate what that essence is? So just as in medicine, you might start with a symptomatic analysis of the different uh, effects that you might see on the body and then work your way back towards a physiological root cause, which explains all the different symptomatic effects. That's what we need to do as well. So that's very exciting. And so I have here in front of us open a Excel spreadsheet and it's completely blank right now. Why? Because I actually want to walk through the entire process with you from start to finish uh, in real time as we analyze these videos. So you can see for yourself, again, see, I, I want to show you uh, tangibly where these conclusions come from. So we're essentially going to recreate the cognitive typology model from scratch using pure observation, building up the observation sets to the conclusions of to why a certain cognition, why a certain psychology is speculated to lie behind or beneath certain voltologies. So it, it's all very transparently put before you so that you can make your own conclusion as to whether or not this is a sensible conclusion to draw. And here we go. Let's begin. And I want to start with the TESI type. Uh, I like to pick on the TESIs. Why? Because the way they come across is so straightforward that they make it quite easy for me to begin a voltology analysis because they're so clear and, and forthcoming in their thoughts and their behaviors that they act as a good benchmark from which I can then compare against others. And so we're going to start with a TESI of the first function conscious development. Okay, and so here again, we have Ted Cruz. We've seen Ted Cruz already, but we only saw 30 seconds of him. So here we're going to see a little bit more, but also we're going to focus more on what is being said along with the voltology. All right, so here we go. Uh, you know, I, I don't. I think actually a lot of people are energized. A lot of people are excited. If you look at these primaries, we're seeing record turnouts. We're so he says that primaries are at record turnouts. That's one of the things he's saying. Okay, let's continue. We're seeing Democratic primary turnouts miserably low. And, and, and I think that is a result of the incredible frustration with where we are as a country, with the failures of the Obama-Clinton economy. And I think people are hungry for a title to express his concerns and, and his concerns about Donald Trump. You know, Mitt and I come from a different place in the political spectrum, but he's, he's entitled to express his concerns. Well, and listen, Mitt is someone I've always liked and respected. Uh, you know, his campaign was not successful. And, and so I think we need to focus on actually energizing and mobilizing all these folks that are coming out. He also talks about energizing and mobilizing folks. Look, we're campaigning to win, and, and I will say anytime you hear people talking about it, bro. <laughs> okay. Uh, and he says, uh, we're campaigning to win. For convention. Uh, I think that is the fevered talk of the Washington establishment. The Washington establishment I I is in a panic. They're, they're confused. They don't understand what's happening. And, and, and their favorite candidates, the ones that they want to win, are not getting the votes. And so now he's saying here that uh, X are not getting the votes. But if a bunch of Washington deal makers try to step in in a brokered convention and steal the nomination, I think we will have a manifest uprise. If you want to beat Donald Trump, and I, and I don't think Donald Trump is the right nominee to go up against Hillary Clinton, if you want to beat him, you got to beat him at the ballot box. And our campaign is the only campaign that has demonstrated we can do so over workers and lobbyists. So now he's saying that if you want to win, you have to do X. In this case, uh, you have to side with somebody who's winning uh, or, or so forth. Now, I want you to notice what's happening here. Th th there's a very abundant spectrum of what somebody could say uh, when they're running for office or for justifying their, their candidacy, right? For example, somebody could focus more on a, a higher ethic that they want to promote, a, a justice that they want to serve, some sort of 
good that they want to champion. There's all sorts of ways to, to run a campaign. But notice how Ted Cruz is approaching it. Uh, what he says, his arguments, at least in this clip, are more to the effect of uh, we're campaigning to win, which is an attitude to have, which is almost like focused on the win, uh, as if this was some sort of game. Uh, X groups are not getting the votes. They're not getting the votes, so they're going to lose. You know, that's kind of how you frame it. Uh, and if you want to win, you have to go with somebody who can get the votes. And I can get the votes, is what he's saying. Notice that uh, he's hardly saying anything other than the causalities that are in effect and where they will lead and, and why he believes he will lead to the win. So he's framing everything in this way, which, it, which is not obvious that you would want to frame it that way uh, as a presidential candidate. That's actually, that's already a, a bias in your perception of reality. And so I just want to lead you to make a mental note of that as we continue on with the other samples. So, okay, here we go with the, the next one. Now we've already looked at Chris Wallace. We're going to take a little bit of a closer look, okay? So here we go. There's a, a new book out you may, um, I suspect you've already read, called The Looming Tower. And it talks about the fact that then there was the bombing of the embassies in Africa and the attack on the coal. Okay, let's just let, let, let me, let me, May I just finish the question, yeah. sir? And, and after the attack, the book says that uh, bin Laden separated his, his leaders, spread them around because he expected an attack, and there was no response. I understand that hindsight is always 20-20. No, let's talk about it. But the question is, no. why didn't you do okay, more? Connect the dots. I, I, I understand. I, I, I don't no, so he talks about current events and political affairs, which is, you know, of course, something we know about already. But he also goes on to question, he's talking with Bill Clinton in this interview. He questions, uh, why didn't you do X? Here, let me hear, hear that again. Is, why didn't you do okay. more? Connect the dots. Why didn't you connect the dots, etc.? He's questioning his, his decisions, his military choices. Now, bear in mind, these may not all lead to patterns, but we're just putting data into the sheet. So next we have Tucker Carlson. It's awful. I mean, abuse of power is always awful. Uh, any kind of power. Sexual power, financial power, any kind of power. It's also really common. People abuse their power by definition. That's just a function of human nature. Um, so I don't think it's surprising. The details are always sort of jarring and jaw-dropping, and someone really did that. I mean, it's... It's shocking, especially when it happens in an industry you're familiar with to people you know. And, you know, it's even more awful in a way. But, um, but if you take three steps back, I mean, it shouldn't surprise you that famous people who sort of bask in public adulation all day long behave poorly when the cameras are off. So in this interview, I think they're talking about the Me Too movement. And uh, what he says is here that uh, the abuse of power is, is awful. But he also says it's common. And he says that, you know, basically the tragic things are unfortunate, but they're almost to be expected. It's almost what, what else would you expect to happen when people have power and the people have credit, uh, authority over others. So he, he seems to be in some way stating a harsh truth as to just kind of like that's just the way the world is. And, and that itself is not to be taken for granted. That not everybody has that view or has that perspective. I mean, no, I think it's totally, look, I mean, we're all hypocrites, right. you know, on some level. Um, and, and that's probably a good thing. You know, and politeness is hypocrisy. How are you this morning? And that's okay. That's what manners are. Um, and so I actually try not to hit people too hard on hypocrisy um, just because, you know, I think it's a human thing. But I, I guess um, I, I couldn't resist noting that NBC fired Notice how, how snippy he is, definitely. You can see the voltology is the same as the other people here. I, I couldn't resist note That the, the sassy head shakes, very similar. Thing. You know, squelched the Harvey Weinstein story that Ronan, the fantastic story that Ronan Farrow wound up, wound up selling to the New Yorker. And like, why? I don't know. I think it's a fair question. Um, and they haven't, they haven't answered it. But no, I feel, I, have a, I worked at NBC for four years. I have a lot of friends over there, decent people, and I feel sorry for everybody who works there. It was shocking. It's always jarring to see people in their natural habitat when you're used to seeing them on television, though. I do think over time, TV reveals the truth. I mean, if you sit in front of a camera every day for years, viewers kind of know who you are, actually. Yeah. On some level, they do. This brings up a question I wanted to ask. Yeah. That level of artifice. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm not smart enough to be that false. And also, it's too hard. I mean, every... I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I believe in kind of... No, of course I don't. Yeah. Everything I say on television, I sincerely believe. 
and if I can just put in a plug for my employer, you know, one great thing about Fox, and this is totally sincere, is no one's ever told me what to say or what to think, ever. And there are not even any guidelines. So I feel completely free to say what I think. But often when, you know, people are yelling at me at untrained platform. Uh, so here we see an unfiltered communication of beliefs. Uh, for those of you who know, Tucker Carlson is kind of known for being outspoken and, and speaking his mind. He was an anchor for Fox News for a long time, and, and he rarely ever shies away from just saying his opinion about what he believes the way he believes it. And so this is what he's talking about here. Opinions are all important to me, but I don't care what people I don't know think. Why would you, and, I, and this is a lecture I always give to my producers or when I supervised, you know, 90 reporters all had Twitter accounts, I was always telling them, you know, don't give emotional control to strangers. Why would you, it's like giving a toddler a handgun, he's gonna misuse it, why would you do that? And here he's talking about not giving emotional control of yourself to others. So here we see a kind of very, uh, a private emotional distance that Tucker Carlson has with other people, a kind of disassociation from them. He doesn't let them affect his emotional life. He has his own uh, emotional control over himself. So that's something interesting. That may or may not be a motif that is universal, but it's interesting to note. So I'm adding it here to the matrix. All right, next we're gonna look at Anthony Mason, who is another anchor. More worries about the banks and the economy. I mean, the Dow is already down 2,000 points. For example, you can buy a share of GE, but we need more help. The Treasury is now considering converting the government's $45 billion stake into common stock. Now, that won't cost the taxpayers any more money, but it could give the government as much as a 40% ownership stake in Citigroup. The idea here is to try to prevent Citigroup stock price from collapsing. It's already at two bucks. So a motif here is finances, stock prices, banks. Remember, even though we may think to ourselves, this is what you would expect somebody to be, to be talking about if you open up the, the, the news channel to, uh, to check uh, finances. Uh, yes, but who you would expect to be saying this? It's not obvious. And so why would all the news anchors have the same voltology, you see? And so the fact that I can show the same voltology and they're also all in, in a similar domain is, is significant and it's worth pointing out because it's not obvious. It could be something else. It could be that there's no thematic voltological correlation to looking up every member of a certain um, demographic. But the fact that over and over uh, news anchors talking about politics and economics and so forth share the same voltility is something that I'm pointing out here and restore some trust in the bank. Wednesday, they're going after the 20 biggest banks to be nationalized. Will this become public? Become public unless those banks are in serious trouble. All right, Anthony. Mason. Dow's biggest rally in two months, and it was fueled by new optimism that Europe is finally getting a grip on its debt crisis. France and Germany agreed over the weekend to come up with a plan to strengthen European banks by early November. Now, something that's kind of understated in all of what we're looking at here is that all these samples so far have been focusing on and not just the logistical consequences in their respective domains, but they do so by pointing out a lot of details, a lot of facts, 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 like names, dates, uh, numbers, figures, so specifics, right? So I'm gonna add that here, uh, just for the sake of completion, I'm gonna say numbers, uh, facts, figures, dates, Finances, stock prices, banks, numbers, facts, figures, and dates. That's just, that seems to be something Anthony Mason is very intent on noticing. So after dipping... And you can see also the voltology. Check out the snippiness of the head. ...into bear territory last month... Oh, he, Monday. You see, the, you see the top squareness of the cheeks? Okay. That's a decline that right of 20% here. from its highs. The S&P... And the way the mouth is wobbling, you can see that there as well. 500 has now rallied back more than 10% in just a week. See, see all of these, they have the same wobbling, the, the tot square and the wobbling of the lips, and they're all into the same things. Virtually clones of each other. All 30 stocks. This was the 10th triple digit move in the Dow in the past 11 sessions. We've had some good economic news, like last Friday's job number, better than expected. So fear... Again, job number, economic news. Okay, so again, I guess uh, current events, uh, news, it's another. So that this is similar to Chris Wallace. They're both uh, into current events, in this case, more politics side. 
Anthony Mason is more into investing stocks and banks. Let's add investing in here. Okay, now we're getting a pretty good handle of what these guys are about. And you're going to start to see commonalities. For example, what does uh, investing in banks and finances have to do with um, uh, campaigning to win, right? They both have a success orientation. And by success, it's some a tangible, real world, uh, economic, social status upgrade, promotion of some sort, right? So the TESI, as you'll see, they're very focused on a kind of uh, real world, numerical, quantitative uh, elevation of, re of reality. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the next sample. This is Jake Tapper. Well, first of all, we should, to be fair, Flake and McCain, I don't think voted for Trump and they made their opposition to Trump fairly clear. Another clone here. Okay, here we go last year. I mean, not as vociferously as they're making it today, but I don't think it's an act of surrender. I think that uh, the Ban Steve Bannons and Breitbart's of the world see that and say that uh, Trump broke flake. Trump is breaking these people. And it is in a good, in a way for them, in a way for Trump, it's good that they're leaving. So he sometimes pauses a little more than the others, but when he gets going, he really gets going, as you can see here. Let's go back up a little bit is breaking these people and it is in a good in a way for them in a way for trump it's good that and then leaving. swing you see that yeah but, so you but still have that plateau velocity real quick we're in a different period right now i um i've been reading a lot about the the 50s um lately and you saw that the cheek right there let's go back up uh, a little bit the the 50s um lately and yeah. there was a period you know joe mccarthy started in the late 40s his crusade of indecency and smears and Joe McCarty started in the late 40s you see again facts numbers dates and uh, consequences logistical consequences so this is uh, Jake Tapper current events news and politics and he's also talking about dates and times okay all right now when are we going to get through this bubble here we seem to be stuck in this uh, TESI political bubble but that can't be all the reality to the TESIs, right? Of course. We're getting, let's, that was the last one. Okay, so I could actually show you more TESIs that are into politics because I have more samples. But I think you get the point at this point and, uh, and pushing it anymore just becomes redundant. So this is part of what I'm going to do. If there is a bubble, a shade, I, I call them shades sometimes. If there is a bubble or a shade of, of a voltage cluster that is so obvious and persistent, I'm just going to show you enough for you to get the gist and then continue on to the rest and see if there's other bubbles, other varieties that we can find within that type. So here next, I'm going to show you Tom Hanks for a change. He is dead, not in politics and news and journalism. He's, a, he's an actor. But let's see if we can see something similar in him to the others. Some people do it for power. They just want to have a degree of power because that's the thing that gives them credence it's something but you know it's a on one hand it's a, a, a parking space with your name on it uh and to take it to another extreme it's the ability uh to beat up on underlings and say things like so you want a job you want to keep pure harass it's a you know to the to the you see that head shake snippiness that was really snippy let's see it again you want to keep pure harass it's a you know to the to the that's the, the sassy shakes so again you have the the assertion, the shakes, everything is there. We have assault. Now, what he's talking about here, let's scroll down here. He's talking about how uh, people in power uh, will abuse their power. Now, we actually saw something interesting in Tucker Carlson here above. He also said, abuse of power is awful, but common. Now, you may think that's an insignificant uh, comment because anybody could say it, but it's actually not obvious. Again, nothing is really obvious. There are all kinds of things you could say to a tragic situation. You could, let's say, for example, uh, to, the, to the Me Too movement tragedy, you, you could see it as, for example, uh, from a psychologist's perspective, as some sort of mass neuroses in our population, or you can see it as some sort of compensation between men and women's dynamics over the years. You can take it a lot of different directions, but to choose specifically to interpret a certain event, social, cultural phenomenon, through the, the lens of people
people have power and they're abusing it, right? That itself is a bias. That itself is a, is a framing, a lens. So now we see here a pattern. TESI is when there's a problem in society, they tend to see it as a problem of somebody having power over somebody else, <laughs> which in a way it echoes back to what Tucker Carlson here about not giving up emotional control of yourself to others. So, so far what we're seeing with the TESIs is, uh, well, first of all, they want to be in, in, in control as we saw here with Ted Cruz in charge, they want to be, they want to win and be in charge. And they also don't want to lose the power that they have and they don't want to be controlled. That seems to be part of what we're seeing here. So, and so they're sensitive to seeing when people are being controlled against their will. They have a sensitivity to seeing that as you'll see partially. So part of conservative values that you'll see, and I'm not saying that they always have to have conservative values, but there's an overwhelming support in that direction because American conservative values value a kind of autonomy of self, self-governance and less governmental governance, which is helping you not give control of yourself away to another external party. And so, you, so you're going to see that. We're, we'll get into that more later. But this is the beginnings of where that is coming from. There are people like that, without a doubt, in Hollywood. I don't think it is as... It's, it's not common core, but without a doubt, it's widespread because human nature comes down to a lot of times those people in power have it for that very, that, that, that ability, that access in order to, uh, in order to be a sexual predator. Well, we so here I'm going to summarize that by saying that human nature is predatorial and opportunistic. All right, now we're done with those samples. So here we have a fun little thing. This is a four-way split screen of just four of the samples in this group. And it kind of helps you have an overall qualitative view of what they're all like. So here we go, ready? There's always a looming tower. Of any kind of talks about the fact sexual power, financial power, any kind of Take a look at their head shakes and, and the timing of their tempo. Look at how much they look like they're four identical twins, like quadruplets. In Africa, and the attack on the whole. You say, let's just let's look like somebody that's you know, just a question. On one hand, it's and sort of surprising attack. The boat's tails are always jarring. The TESIs always impress me with how similar they are to each other. And like in psychology and voltology, it's just wow. And so part of what we're looking at here with these videos is a series of threads that I made called the definitive voltology threads. And I made some notes back then as well, which may be useful for us to go over sometimes just to skim a few things down here. I summarized all these guys essentially by this list, which is a kind of earlier draft of the of a motif matrix. So here I say the psychological profile of these individuals are they're blunt, they're frank, they're opinionated, they're matter of fact, they're business minded, very much so, entrepreneurial, uh, politically inclined, patriarchal or masculine, uh, economically savvy, as we saw with Anthony Mason, meritocratic and pro-capitalism, as we saw with Tucker Carlson, and often anti-socialism. Okay, so now, remember when I said before that all the types within uh, human psychology exist within an intersection of male and female psychology. So when you're typing with voltology, if you don't account for the fact that, that the male and male and female counterparts to the types have somewhat of a different flavor to them, then you'll actually fail to do the readings a lot of times. Remember we talked about grasping the full range of voltologies out there in the world. Part of that is actually the duplication of the types into two genders. And so we're going to examine the psychological and voltological differences within the genders. All the guys that we just looked at, they were all uh, male and they were all later on in age, like in the 40s plus 50s, 60s. So now we're going to ask a completely different question and say, what happens if I want to know what a TESI looks like when they're a woman and when they're young, right? Like a young TESI woman. Let's see what that looks like. Hey, Ellen, we need to talk about Teresa Caputo, the Long Island medium who claims she can speak to the dead. You've had her on your show before, and you're planning to have her on your show again. Don't get me wrong, if Caputo can really do the things she says she can do, then promoting her is not just a good idea, it's a moral imperative. After all, she's discovered proof of the afterlife, the greatest discovery in human history. She's going to win a Nobel Prize. Several Nobel Prize. All the Nobel Prizes, even the fake one in economics. Okay, so this is Rebecca Watson, and if you're not familiar with her, she does these very sarcastic and snarky videos, kind of bashing a lot certain things that are not logical, not rational. 
She's a very rationally minded individual. In this case, she's going after a medium, so a psychic, who is being promoted by Ellen DeGeneres and invited onto her show. And she's saying that, please, please don't do that. Don't promote that BS, you know, in her opinion. So first what I'm going to do here is I'm going to separate out males, females, Rebecca Watson. And here I'm going to put sarcastic wit uh, and I'm going to put pro-science anti anti woo, -woo. okay uh, these are this is my motif matrix I get to um, put whatever I want on it so here's what I'm putting on it for now let's see what else she has to say then promoting her is akin to selling jars of unicorn poop as antidepressants it's immoral it's dangerous, and frankly, it's full of crap. You've probably guessed by now, because you are a smart and insightful and very funny woman, that I feel Caputo is full of crap, and you'd be right. I've seen her act before. I've seen John Edward do it, I've seen Sylvia Brown do it, and I've seen magicians do it. Magicians who admit that they have no psychic powers at all. They can do exactly what Teresa Caputo is doing. She's doing a magic trick called cold reading, and I won't go into all of the details, but cold reading can involve things like throwing out general statements that can apply to a number of people in a large audience, all of whom have come to hear about their dead relatives, makes some people feel better. Okay, I'll stop there. And now I want to go over the Voltology a little bit because this is a new Voltology to look at. There's a little bit more of a, of a looseness in the body, and yet there's very definitive head shakes, just like we saw there. Very definitive head uh, nods and hand gestures. Now, the framing of this video is a little bit confusing because we don't get to see her in an interview format. We'll get, we're going to see more that are in a, in a better format. So, But I'm just trying to introduce you to a Voltology. But let's move down below because it takes two at least to make a pattern. So let's continue. Destruction of the nuclear family and basically all the ideas that are popular in media today. And I do that because I think there needs to be a balancing. I think our throwing away of traditional values was kind of a throwing the baby out with the bathwater situation. And I really think we need to consider some of the statistics, some of the really important information about love and relationships and marriages that we got from time beforehand. Now, I don't usually respond to comments because... The first thing I would say here as a motif is uh, traditional values. Let's see what else. In my opinion, comments don't represent what I say. However, I have gotten so many comments lately that have misinterpreted the message I'm trying to put out there that it's gotten to a point where, unfortunately, I think I do need to address it. I, I could read some of the tweets I get, read anyway, on my video asking young ladies if they would like a dog or kids or Netflix or a marriage. And this is not the kind of message I am trying to... Look at her mouth wobbling. It's very clear wobbling. Let's go here again. This one. Dog or kids Look at or here. Netflix or a marriage. And this is not the kind there. of message I am trying to give out. I am not trying to sell an idea that myself as a 22 year old needs to be married right now for the sake of traditionalism and not being a degenerate. No, in fact, I think it would be degenerate for me to get married right now without someone that I'm truly in love with and think could be a good father to my children. In fact, I think that would be significantly worse for the Western world. That would be significantly worse for my children to raise them as a single mother. As, as you know, they're more likely to commit suicide, more likely to be alcoholics, more likely to drop out of school. And it's just devastating growing up with a broken family. Okay, so she has a bit more focus on things like uh, family values and personal values. She seems to be very focused on doing what is honoring of herself and also what's honoring of her, her family. So already here, you, you can start to see some of the male and female differences starting to manifest. Even TE lead women have somewhat of a more maternal nurturing component to them relative to their baseline. So next we have Sophia. The overarching reason why I left BuzzFeed is to have independence. And for me, that means a few things, but I'll start off with transparency. Okay, let's just start right there. Independence. Well, just as she says more things, continue. 
And by transparency, I mean transparency and open lines of communication between myself and you guys watching. One of the main things that bothered me was that I was not supposed to communicate with you guys on YouTube. And okay, so what she means by independence and transparency here is uh, more like to independence to talk about whatever she wishes, <laughs> which is different because independence can mean a lot of things. Independence here is more like a for her to share her own thoughts with whoever she wants, however she wants. What I mean by that is that we were told not to read the comments, but further than that, we were not supposed to reply to any comments in the comment section on the videos that we made. A lot of you guys might know how much I love talking to you guys on social media, but I was never allowed to talk. Now notice also, she's, she's very assertive and she's very bold in how she comes across, but she fits more of the voltology of the other woman we saw, for example, her. So I'm not going to get married in the sense that there's somewhat of a softer element to her movements. Talk to you guys on YouTube. So if there was a comment that I really loved or something I thought was really funny in the comments, I couldn't say that I liked it. And if there was a question or a misconception, I couldn't clarify anything. And I think that that's a big part of YouTube, being able to talk to the people watching. Another point on transparency is that there's really no clarity to the viewers about what video producers do at BuzzFeed and which videos they make. For example, a lot of people thought that I was an actress for BuzzFeed and didn't know that I not only made a lot of videos for Ladylike, I actually started Ladylike with Freddie. Because our names aren't attached to the videos that we make, people would often ask me to explain or answer for videos or even articles that were produced by other people that I had nothing to do with, that were sometimes made on the other side of the country or even the other side of the world. And that would often put me in a little bit of a sticky situation because I didn't want to speak for other people or what they had created. The only thing that I could speak for was ladylike. So the lack of transparency between BuzzFeed and you guys kind of made me both not able to take credit for the work that I did, but also made me overly accountable for decisions that were made in other parts of the company that I had nothing to do with. Okay, so there we see, let's summarize it as a ownership of one's own ideas and non-accountability for ideas not one's own. Okay, and now here's Blair White. I think all these identities are largely bullshit. I think they're super arbitrary. Uh, watch the mouth wobbles. This one is very clear. I think they're super meaningless. I think people who take them on See, are usually extremely right boring and have nothing else for their personality other than I'm demi-queer, non-binary, gender fuck, special snowflake kin. And if you pay attention to these people, you'll notice that very rarely will you meet someone who identifies as one of these things who is not heavily involved in political activism to some extent, who's not a feminist to some extent. And that's because it's usually, not always, but usually a political tactic to take on one of these identities. It's a reach for oppression points. These people are usually middle-class, white, never had to struggle with anything in their life, but they want to call themselves this oppressed, sexual, gender minority. So here we see her in identity politics as a motif. LGBTQ plus criticism, criticism, although she is herself trans. As a means to silence any type of opposition they have in any type of political conversation. Because in our current political climate, oppression is a very valuable currency. So it's really important to note there's no basis in science whatsoever for any of these obscure identities. Non-binary, gender fluid, gender queer, none of them have any evidence backing them pointing towards their validity whatsoever. Okay, she seems to have somewhat of a, of a, of a pro-science view here. So I'm going to label this as fact-checking and pro-science. So, so we have several examples here where Rebecca Watson is also calling people out on, on their bullshit. And we have here Blair White also calling people out on their bullshit. In the case of Rebecca, it's when the, the mediums and psychics are claiming to have powers they don't. In the case of Blair White, it's when people are imagining themselves as being certain special snowflake unicorn uh, identities which have no scientific basis. So that kind of lack of a, of a literality, lack of literal truth, kind of disqualifies with their claims in the minds of these individuals and the TESI types. But that's important because remember we talked about how uh, in, in cognitive type, the S is more about uh, literal information, not necessarily physical in the sense of like uh, senses, not in the sense of like they, they prefer sensations, as in uh, sight, touch, etc. No, what we're, what we're seeing here with these samples is there's a focus on um, 
discreteness of definition, like actuality in the sense of, uh, for example, a number, a number is not a, a sensation, right? But a number is, is a discrete quantity. Facts are discrete quantities. Uh, so facts, figures, numbers, details don't have to be sensational in nature, and yet they are discrete and literal. And that's what really matters. All these people, including these here as the males, they're very much focused on facts, numbers, figures, and they're not sensations, but they're literal information. And by literal, I mean that they're, they're bound within a set and they're, they're clear. They're clear in the, in the limits of what they are. You know, four isn't five. And so four is four and only four. So that's what it means for something to be literal. And so if something's not literally true, uh, the, these female TESI seem to protest it. <laughs> now, something else that's worth mentioning here, which I kind of glossed over, is that Rebecca Watson is also involved in identity politics and the whole feminism, anti-feminism debate, which isn't something that we're seeing here in this particular video because of the one I selected, but you can look her up and you'll see that she's very much into that. So I'm going to add that there, identity politics and anti-feminism. So here you have identity politics, identity politics, Okay, so now we're going to see these four together in a collage to get the sense of what the voltology of this bubble is like. So you see there's a similarity in their voltology, but it's also distinct from the one that we saw with the males, which is why it's important to differentiate male and female uh, voltology. There's a bit more of a forward push with the males, but with here, the women, there's a little bit more softness uh, to their movements. And yet, if you were to discuss something with them, you would certainly come across feeling that they're very strong women, and because they are. So, but the voltology is just a little slightly different. Now, I also summarized them in a qualitative sense before, and here's what I wrote back then, that they are also a blunt, frank, and opinionated, very much snarky, right, critical. Uh, they, they're unafraid to unpack really heated and taboo topics. So this is something that we didn't talk about. They, these women, they talk about things like uh, rape, sex, and corruption very openly. Like they just say things that are very almost R-rated, without batting an eye, in, in a way that uh, reflects part of what we saw with these men, where, for example, Tucker Carlson has unfiltered communication of beliefs, very similar in that sense. Now, this makes these women what you might say is uh, uh, unladylike, and I mean that by their own admission, oftentimes. They will see themselves as being more masculine. Now, another motif that we see within them is that they're, they battle against issues of identity and identity politics. So we have in them all somewhat of a, a focus on personal values and personal beliefs and a critique of false beliefs of personhood that others might have. So if others are, are deceiving themselves as to who they are, uh, they're very opinionated about that deceit that the other people have and they're, they're opinionated about what they believe of themselves. And lastly, as you watch more of these YouTubers, you'll see that they focus a lot on wanting to be uh, independent and competent women. Okay, so now, as if it wasn't already enough to try to hold in your mind the complexity between male and female TESIs, there's a difference between types who have what we call a guarded or an unguarded emotional attitude. And this, can, it, this is something that affects the expression of things like the voice, expression of things like the emotional radiation of a person. Earlier in the other video when we saw the FI leads, I mentioned that all the FI types that we went through and we saw they were all uh, very soft and gentle and bashful. They were radiating but in a joyous way, right? That is called Sealy energy. So when we saw Marilyn Monroe, she is a Sealy in her emotional attitude. Same thing with uh, Emily and uh, Amanda. They're all Sealy types. And what you just saw with these four women here is called unsealy. Now the, the unsealy aspect of the FI and the TE user is very snarky, blunt as you saw with uh, Rebecca Watson here. In other words, th th there's a sort of a, a callousness in the, in the heart of the individual which causes 
a kind of radiation, yes, but radiation of this kind of more negative vibration energy, more of a sass, more of a sarcasm, more of a snarkiness, instead of radiating out vulnerability, affect, and, and giddy joy, which, so the, the TESI types, they're very transparent in either direction. Either, either they're transparent in how much they, they're disgusted and dislike something, and they're very just, they, they, they give you all the, the, the dark energy, or they give you all the light energy. But in either way, they just kind of spill it out. That's why they're candid. Candid is the common denominator here. So, but the emotional expression is it's, it's not a type dimension. It's, it's, let me repeat that. Emotional attitude is not type related, which is to say, so if you were born a TESI, right? You're not stuck in either of those two things. You can switch between them. Uh, if type is inborn as a cognitive uh, mode of thinking, then, then it, it must also be possible for you to, as a person, be whichever which way you want in terms of your emotional disposition towards life and towards other people. So we need to see, we really need to see examples of TESIs that have that side to them and that is more warm and fuzzy and so forth. But we need to see what that looks like because it's specific and it's unique in each type. And so we're going to show you examples of Sealy TESIs. And I'm going to just play through the video first, go through some of the signals that we see and then discuss the psychology afterwards. Love if you've experienced the loss of a spouse or partner due to death. Uh, so first right here, you see the, the head shakes and very snippy and very uh, plateau velocity, right? Now pay attention to the mouth. A divorce or separation. Or Wobbling. Even if you've been in a long-term relationship for a long time. Head shakes again, time, plateau. And it's ended. The, the, the top square effect. So all of the steps, all of the strategies are for all of those individuals. Running. Steps and strategies. Uh, she's talking about her book, which is called here, uh, Six Simple Steps to a New and Happy Relationship. And it's about finding love again. She has a uh, love advice. Basically, she, she wrote a book on love advice. Around with a lot of myths a lot of unrealistic expectations that have been passed down from generations. Uh, notice her voice is breathy and, and whispery. That's part of the Sealy of ontology. Generation to generation, we've learned from our parents or our friends or even the media. And so what we need to do is look at those expectations, look at those attitudes or beliefs about relationships or about how our partner should treat us and make sure they're realistic. They're not a should statement in so she's saying, basically, we have to look at whatever we've um, inherited as far as beliefs about how we ought to behave and so forth. Look at them critically and measure not whether or not they're realistic, right? Now, notice that the measuring whether or not it's realistic, <laughs> the word realistic comes up a lot with the TESI. And it has to do with, as we saw here in the motif matrix, it has to do with this no bullshit attitude here, for example, uh, the anti-woo-woo, but also the, the anti-falseness. Uh, when, when it comes to beliefs, the TESIs don't like to believe anything that is literally false, and they like to use some sort of information-based evidence to help steer them in the direction of what is true. And by information, I mean some literal information, some, some facts, some details, some objective criteria, right? And so in this case, she, uh, you, you'll see this more with the next sample. So basically she's saying that um, we believe a lot of stuff people have told us that is misguiding us and it's not really true. And most of our attitudes or most of our ideas really are. For example, one of the myths that I find a lot, oh, I just told you that it's a myth. Oh. Individuals need to wait before they date again. How long do couples need to wait before they date again? That's the question. If they've experienced the loss of a partner due to death or a divorce. Do they need to wait a specific period of time before they date again? So this is a, a, a myth that she's debunking. Well, Every year that you've been together, that's too complicated. two years, <laughs> all of Notice the head shakes so loud and, and wide. All of those, but the reality is is that there's no predetermined time period. Now, you're really going to see this more when we get into the FE users, but even though she's in a way trying to be smoother, like trying to be warmer, uh, it's, not, it's, it's a bit uncanny. It's still not really having the warm swells. It's more like she's just slowing down 
per plateau, but it's still a plateau that is still plateauing. And, and, and the, the affect that she's leaking out is, is not guiding you. It's more just like hitting you, uh, sprinkling on top of you. But okay, so she, in order to make sense of her, I have to present to you the second example. And this is Brene Brown. We may run into Brene Brown later on in these series, but I wanted to put her here because in, in this video, she, she's just using her first function. For those of you not familiar with Brene Brown, I very much encourage you to watch her TED talk. It's very interesting. It's about vulnerability. So here we go. Biggest myth about vulnerability is that it's weakness. I think a lot of people were raised to believe that. It was modeled, I think, certainly in our culture. Um, we see that a lot, that to be vulnerable, to be open. Notice that the wobbling lips. See right there? The top square. That a lot. That, that to be vulnerable, to be open, to be exposed is to be weak. Um, and the truth is, you know, what I found in my research is that vulnerability is not weakness. What I found in my research, not <laughs> You really needed to watch her TED Talk to really appreciate her as an example and really as, as, a, as a case study of what a TESI is. So in her TED Talk, she talks about how she, she's she been kind of a, a brass tacks, uh, academically minded, very sciencey focused individual uh, as a person. But she had a bit of a, a breakdown at some point in her life where in her research, her dry, academic, impersonal research, led her to the conclusion that uh, vulnerability was what she needed in her life. So you have an example here of this, the, the objective, mechanically minded aspects of her as a TESI guiding her to the, real, to the emotional realization that she needs to be softer and more vulnerable. And, and it explains her journey as to how she dealt with that, which of course is part of the TESI's battle in life as it is with all of us. So this is an, an example of a TESI really battling with vulnerability. It's, it's very fascinating, but I'm going to play a bit more so you can see a bit more of how she describes it. In fact, I would argue that it's our greatest measure of courage. When we went out and asked people, what is vulnerability? We heard things like vulnerability is the first date after my divorce. Vulnerability is starting my own company. Vulnerability is taking responsibility for something that went wrong at work. Vulnerability is sitting with my wife who has stage three breast cancer and making plans for our young kids. Um, vulnerability is taking my business public. You know, the definition I use in my work of vulnerability is simply uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. Vulnerability is about the willingness to show up and to be seen even when there are no guarantees. And it's interesting to me, I mean, one of the things that I thought was really interesting, I gave a talk, um, it's probably a couple years now, and it was being translated by people doing American Sign Language, and they came up before the talk started, and they said, are there any words that you're going to use a lot in your talk that we should you know, know about that are might be different? And I said, well, I use the word vulnerability a lot. And they kind of, there were two of them, and they kind of looked at each other, and they said, oh, we do, we do this for vulnerability. And I said, what does that mean? They said, it means weak in the knees. And I'm like, wow, that's not how I talk about vulnerability. And she said, well, there's only one other sign for vulnerability. And I said, what is it? And she said, and I said, oh, that's what I'm talking about. And so to me, vulnerability is our most accurate measure of courage. I mean, it's pretty powerful when I have 13,000 pieces of data collected over 12 years. 13,000 pieces of data collected over 12 years. Once again, the data, pieces of data. So Terry Orbach. Terry, Guides to Finding Love, False Inherited Beliefs. Okay, and for Brene Brown, the science focus researcher and a researcher on vulnerability and self-help books on courage and bravery, uh, which you can see here. These are some of Brene Brown's books titled uh, Rising Strong, uh, Braving the Wilderness, daring greatly, basically being bold and being yourself and not being afraid of being vulnerable, which is very hard for any human to be, right? That I cannot find a single incident or story of courage that was not completely underpinned by vulnerability. Also, again, we see the d a data focus and the details and information focus. Okay, so now that we've gone through these two samples, what we see with both of them is that they're more soft and sweet in their focus, but yet they both 
approach the matter with that more uh, impersonal solution oriented cognition, which goes to show that TESIs can be uh, soft and into love and into intimacy and all that, uh, uh, of course. That, that should really go without saying. But the reason I need to bring it up at all is because of how this idea sometimes doesn't exist in other typologies. And, and if somebody's approaching uh, model one here, coming from another system, they might make the error of mixing the systems and then assuming that what we mean by TESI is what they understand by ESTJ, in which case they don't have a concept of, an, of a TESI that uh, might actually be uh, agreeable and uh, harmonious and seeking that sort of thing, uh, the more warm and fuzzy things, which is what they define as F, but that's not what we define as F. So having an emotional attitude that is feely in the sense of like vulnerable and so forth, loving, that, that is not a typological category. Understand that. That's not a typological category because that would mean that you're born having more of that quality than some other people. No, that's something that happens to you in life. That's something environmental. People become soft and compassionate or, or the opposite, more based on how what happens to them and what choices they make in life. You don't choose a certain type. And so you, you can't have that be a typological category. So what you, what you end up instead with is a situation in which you can be more of a, a mechanically minded, logistically minded individual who may nevertheless be either calloused and harsh or soft and tender. Both of those options are available to you, yet you still come from this kind of orientation, which is very procedural, very robotic in the sense of problem, solution, problem, solution, facts, give me the facts, let me solve it through the facts. That's how they approach problems, including the problem of how to solve love and how to solve the, the human predicament of being a, a vulnerable person. All of that is part of what they work on, what they use, all of that analytical power towards. And so that's what you're seeing with these two individuals. So, okay, I think that's enough examples of the TESI with a standard development.